I'm going to start off about 2,000 years ago. This is Pliny the Elder, who on August 25th in 79 was trying to rescue some friends of his who were stuck on the shore near Pompeii. And you can see Vesuvius erupting here and this toxic gas cloud coming down and, and doing in Pliny the Elder. Um, however, earlier in 79, here it goes. Um, he actually published his, his great work, which was an, basically a natural history of everything, or at least everything that was known at that time. Um, he almost got it finished. He got the pa page proofs back, but didn't make the final corrections. And what this is noteworthy for, or frequently is referred to as, is the first written record of allelopathy in plants. So the first evidence that plants produce chemical compounds that inhibit the growth of other plants. Um, so after, after I'd seen this a few times in various papers citing Pliny in 79, I actually decided to look up to see what he actually wrote. And that's this here, um, which is a little bit ambiguous. So he talks about the shadows of various trees, and that of the walnut tree is particularly heavy and harmful, both to the human head and everything else that's close enough. And so this actually is now what's referred to as the first written mention of allelopathy. And it probably has to do with the fact that this is you know, retroactive. You know, people have since then, obviously, um, discovered juglone in plants, in, in walnut trees. This is the first, or one of the first, plant natural products that was ever completely elucidated in terms of the structure, the first one that was synthesized, and then also the first um, natural product that was shown to have allelopathic compounds. So this is a relatively slow process over the period of about 80 years. But it's pretty clear that juglone from walnut trees is an allelopathic compound. If you're any sort of home gardener, you would know probably if you have walnut trees that things like cabbage and tomatoes grow very poorly under walnut trees, whereas things like beans and um, onions do relatively well. So juglone has a selective inhibitory effect on certain plant species and probably gives the walnut tree some sort of advantage. In the sort of food and cosmetic industry, it's known as natural brown number seven. You can use it to either make your food brown or your hair brown. And this may be the 2,000-year the rumor that it's bad to sit under walnut trees because your hair turns brown. Um, in terms of crop plants, allelopathy is really sort of a golden grail of, of plant breeding. What you'd want to have is some crop plant that makes a toxic compound that kills all your weeds and itself is resistant to it. So sort of like a a corn plant that produces its own Roundup, but it's also Roundup resistant. And so a lot of effort has been looked into looking at, uh, to put into looking at natural variation in crop plants to see if there are ones that are naturally weed resistant. And um, rice is really the main uh, target of this kind of research. And there is literally dozens of papers of this kind where they um, you know, take their control rice plant, look how many weeds are growing in a given circle around the plant, and then take ones that are you know, either more or less allelopathic. They count the number of weeds, and some of them have a really quite weed suppressive. Um, one thing that's not apparent from this um, sort of study is whether this is really allelopathy or is the rice just growing more vigorously and outcompeting the other plants. And that sort of thing is really difficult to determine. Is it outgrowing the other plants or is it killing them with um, toxic compounds? But there's correlative studies that may provide this sort of indication that's illustrated here. So on the x-axis here, these are in vitro assays looking at root growth inhibition by extracts of um, plants, of rice plants that is, and then these same plants looking at the weed suppressive properties in the soil out in the field. And there is at least a somewhat positive correlation suggesting some sort of cause and effect relationship between the production of uh, inhibitory compounds in the root exudates with now suppression of the weeds in, in the field. Um, breeding for this trait has been difficult. This is just one um, F2 population looking now at weed suppression in a, a given radius of plants uh, crossing um, a USDA selection that was selected as being very highly weed resistant and a very sensitive line. And you get this bell curve, which indicates there's a lot of different genes involved. And in fact, despite a lot of effort by a lot of readers, none of these sort of genetic mapping studies have ever resulted in the identification of any sort of gene or small molecule that's involved in weed suppression in rice 
simply because there's lots of small effect QTL involved here, and people haven't been successful in finding the underlying genetic basis. So instead now, um, what's been done is to say, rather than looking at you know, the quantitative trait of weed suppression, let's look for specific compounds that are suppressing weeds. And here is where we, where we get into a lot of pseudoscience, because if you take any given plant and grind it up and put it on the roots of another plant, you're going to get suppression of growth at some concentration. And the question is really, you know, is this physiologically relevant? And so I've made a list here of what I think, you know, maybe some of the traits of a, what we would call a, a good or a real allelopathic compound. You want to have something that's toxic to the other plants at a very low concentration, so physiologically relevant. You don't want to have like two millimolar of your compound um, on the roots of another plant. Um, the producing plant obviously resi is resistant. It should be exuded by the roots. And you also want something that's fairly stable and diffusible in the soil if you're going to be you know, killing your neighboring weeds. And so there's literally dozens of compounds that have been identified in rice. Um, these are the three which I think are the most you know, convincing. Um, momolactone, which I'll talk about a little bit more here now, some um, flavones and some cyclohexanones have been identified, which are toxic to other plants at low micromolar concentrations, are exuded by rice, the rice is and the rice is resistant. All of these have been shown to suppress some sort of weed growth, but again, this is something that's very much environmentally dependent. Not all weeds are equally sensitive. It depends on the soil, the temperature, the light intensity, things like that. So there's a lot of natural variation, that sort of thing. Among all known allelopathic compounds, the momolactones are the only one where people have actually done the final crucial experiment, which is to take a plant, knock out the biosynthesis of this compound, plant it next to the weed and see if you're inhibiting growth. This is work that was done by Ruben Peters' lab in uh, Iowa State University. So they took a, a terpene um, cyclase mutant that's not able to make momolactones, either momolactone A or B. And then um, here's the mutant, here's the wild top on the HPLC chromatogram. The plants look fairly normal. And then they planted weed seeds. This is still on, on filter paper now, though. And next to these um, rice plants, and next to the wild-type rice plant, the root length elongation of both lettuce and barnyard grass was less than next to the, the mutant plant, suggesting that this particular compound, the product of this terpene synthase, the momolactone A and B, are in fact in inhibitory for root growth of these weeds. So this is sort of the, the current state of the art. Um, even these best studied compounds like the momolactones probably only account for a small percentage of rice weed inhibitory, probably less than 5%. And there's a lot of room now to look for new chemical compounds in rice that might be um, inhibiting weed growth or inhibiting um, you know, other plants that are growing around the rice. And um, there clearly are a lot of rice metabolites that are unknown yet. Um, if you look at any typical plant out there in nature, we have about 30,000 genes. We can identify all of these genes pretty easily now by sequencing. And it's estimated like rice and every other plant has about 5,000 metabolites. Of these, we know the identity and function of only a few hundred of them. That means another 4,000 or so metabolites in rice that are completely unknown, that are encoded somewhere in these 30,000 genes. And that's really the... the what we need to work on in terms of metabolism is to figure out what's in a plant and how are these metabolites being made. I got into this business with rice in particular through a, a sort of forced collaboration brought upon by National Science Foundation. They had a call for proposals that had to be on three months notice, working on metabolomics, uh, submitting identical proposals to the National Science Foundation in English and translated into Japanese, submitted to the JST in Japan. I did this together with Yukata Okumoho, who's a rice breeder, and Naoki Mori, who's the chemical ecologist. And these three sentences really um, summarize what we propose to do. It's really all you need to know. We said that we would identify novel rice metabolites, specifically ones that are inducible as being those that are most likely to have any sort of defensive function. We would then identify their biosynthetic enzymes, and then we'd figure out what they're good for. And this last part here is, is clearly the most difficult part of, of those three things that we plan to do. Um, to further stack the deck to try to make sure that we find something truly novel, what we decided to look for is non-protein amino acids in rice. So as you probably know, there's 20 protein amino acids, but plants in various combinations produce literally hundreds of different non-protein amino acids. 
Uh, here, for instance, is cannabinine, which is found in alfalfa sprouts, which acts as an analog of arginine and is therefore toxic. Uh, dihydroxyphenylalanine is converted to dopamine in animals and can interfere with the neurosystem. If you're growing uh, plants in Cayuga Heights here, you might grow lily of the valley, which can produces a proline analog, which is so toxic that not even the deer eat it. Um, um, 5-hydroxytryptophan is a precursor of serotonin, so it's sold at Green Star as a the health supplement. And so there's lots of non-protein amino acids, which almost certainly the plants are making, you know, very sporadically in different plant species to interact with other plants, with, interact with insects, interact with pathogens. And so none, no non-protein amino acids had been discovered in rice, and so that's what we set out to do, is to say, does rice have any defensive non-protein amino acids? And this is really the first experiment here. This is an HPLC chromatogram. In green, the bars are all the 20 protein amino acids. In red, we have here a, a peak now in Nipponbari rice. This is the first sequenced rice um, line. And then in Kazalat, a different rice cultivar, we actually don't see this compound. And so this was now our compound of interest. We knew it was present in rice. It's a non-protein amino acid. I don't show it here, but it's actually also induced by treatment with jasmonic acid. And so we thought this is a good candidate for being a um, you know, defense or interactive sort of metabolite in rice. Um, initially, we purified this compound. We found that it had exactly the same mass as tyrosine, the protein amino acid, but clearly it ran differently on the HPLC, an indication that this is not tyrosine, but rather something else that's found here in the rice plant. And then a lot of um, mass spectrometry later on, which is summarized here in this slide, is, um, what we found here is beta tyrosine. So here on the top is the purified compound for Nipponbari rice, its fragmentation pattern on the GCMS. This is a trimethylsilyl derivatized beta tyrosine, so the mass here is 353. And this is now the same compound from Sigma, um, which has the identical fragmentation pattern on the GCMS. And so we assume um, identical fragmentation pattern, identical runtime on the GCMS. We're looking at the same compound now, and we have here beta tyrosine identified in rice. I've drawn this here now as R beta tyrosine. Uh, I haven't actually shown you that this is what it is, but we've done those experiments. This is now on an HPLC chiral column, um, experiments done by Naoki Mori in Japan. He now took R beta tyrosine, the purified compound, S beta tyrosine as a purified compound, and then our Nipambare um, metabolite, which co-eludes now with the, beta the R form of the beta tyrosine. So what we have now is an R amino acid in rice, which has um, not been found previously in rice or any other plant. So um, looking at this here, this is our typical tyrosine that you would find in, in any organism. And what beta tyrosine really is, is the amino group shifted here from the alpha carbon to the beta carbon and from an L amino acid to a D amino acid or S to R amino acid. So, if you're like me, you've probably never thought much about beta amino acids or beta phenylalanine, beta tyrosine in general. So we had to look this up. Where is this normally found in nature? And where it's studied a lot, where it's looked at a lot, is in bacterial polyketide antibiotics and in Taxol, an anti-cancer drug from Pacific U. So all of these are um, some form of non-ribosomal peptides, heavily modified, but they all have either beta phenylalanine or beta tyrosine as a constituent. So there's actually been a lot of research now in the biosynthesis of these metabolites because of their antibiotic properties and their anti-cancer properties. And so we know that these organisms all make these beta amino acids and then incorporate them into their um, antibiotic or um, in this case, Taxol and some of these others also have anti-cancer functions, at least in human bioassays. So there's a lot of interest now in studying enzymes that are involved in the production of beta tyrosine and beta phenylalanine simply because of their med medical relevance. What's unique in rice, though, is we've tried very hard to see if beta tyrosine is incorporated into any larger molecule like this, but we haven't been successful. That doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. But rice is still somewhat unique compared to any of these other organisms in that we see accumulation of the free beta tyrosine, which we don't see in any, any of these other organisms or any other plant, for that matter, that's ever been investigated. If we look to see where in the rice seedling beta tyrosine is present, we see it in the dry seeds before we plant them. And then in the growing seedlings, it's um, most abundant in the leaves. But we see it also in the seeds, the roots, and the culture medium 
Um, 100 micromolar is on the order of most other amino acids, actually more abundant than the vast majority of uh, protein amino acids in rice. And here again in the Nipponbari rice cultivar, we can see that there's induction by jasmatic acid treatment, suggesting that this might be somehow involved in, in plant defense. Um, our next aim then was to see how does um, rice make beta tyrosine, and our first hypothesis was that rice is converting tyrosine to beta tyrosine. To test this hypothesis, what we did is we ordered um, isotope labeled tyrosine, a uh, um, standard protein amino acid, labeled here with carbon-13 and nitrogen-15, so a mass of uh, plus 10 atomic mass units. We put the rice in a little base here and let it take up. Um, the tyrosine, we did these experiments with Nipponbari rice, which does make beta tyrosine, and IR64, another rice cultivar which does not make beta tyrosine. Uh, first, just to show that we do get uptake, this is now, again, a GCMS chromatogram. Um, showing the fragments that we're measuring here. So for instance, this fragment here has three isotope labeled atoms. And so we see here the mass of 218 for the natural tyrosine in the plant, and then 221 for the C13 and 15 labeled tyrosine, and then again here for the other fragment, 280 and 289. And in these plants in the vase, the majority of the tyrosine in the plant is now um, the labeled tyrosine. And we can ask, is this labeled tyrosine now converted to beta tyrosine in the plant? And the short answer is yes, but only in the Nipponbari rice variety, because as I told you, the IR64 cultivar doesn't produce beta tyrosine. And so here, the fragmentation pattern of beta tyrosine is slightly different, but we get full incorporation of all the carbons and the nitrogen from tyrosine into beta tyrosine in these rice plants. So what that suggested to us is that what rice must have is some sort of tyrosine amino mutase that's converting alpha tyrosine here to beta tyrosine. So taking this amino group and shifting it over one carbon and changing it from an S to an, to an R configuration. So these types of enzymes have been found previously in bacteria, and um, they're ones that both make R beta tyrosine or, or S beta tyrosine. Um, before I continue this, along this line, I'd first like to talk a little bit about the distribution of beta tyrosine in different rice cultivars. That's illustrated here. So initially what we did is we looked for beta tyrosine in a collection of Japanese rice cultivars. And this is you know, 50 or so different um, Japanese uh, commercial cultivars. And we can see that in you know, maybe two thirds, 70% of them, we see the presence of beta tyrosine. And in the others, we don't see any beta tyrosine at all. It's simply not detectable. What's also noteworthy here, as I told you originally, we'd found this metabolite as being a jasminate-induced metabolite in Nipponbari rice, but it turns out that Nipponbari is really an exception in this respect, in that we see only two other cultivars where beta tyrosine is jasminate-induced. So we really got lucky looking for a jasminate-induced metabolite that we were working with a rice cultivar where it is actually jasminate-induced. Um, this is now a different... Um, collection also from the Japanese Rice Stock Center. This is now a worldwide collection of rice cultivars. I've listed the different countries here. On the left here is again Nipponbari. And what should be obvious now is that in this worldwide rice collection, the presence and synthesis of beta tyrosine is much less abundant than in the Japanese rice collection. And so what we can do now is ask, you know, what's different about the ones that have beta tyrosine and that don't have beta tyrosine in these plant collections? This is a graph that I lifted from a paper from Susan Makucha's lab showing now phylogeny of different rice cultivars. On the left here, we have the Indica and, and Ausch group. On the right, we have the Japonica groups. And beta tyrosine is present almost exclusively in the temperate Japonica rice cultivars. So it suggests that somewhere in the domestication of rice, we kept the beta tyrosine production in the temperate Japonica rice cultivars, which are the ones that are grown mostly in Japan and we didn't have it or lost it in the production of India cultivars or also tropical Japonica and aromatic rice cultivars. Um, what this natural variation now allows us to do is to say we want to do genetic mapping. We have rice cultivars that produce beta tyrosine, rice cultivars that don't produce beta tyrosine. What is now the genetic difference between those two and can we identify an enzyme that produces beta tyrosine? 
Um, the first experiment we did now was with chromosome substitution lines. As I mentioned in one of the early slides, Kazalaf does not make beta tyrosine. And these lines all have segments of Kazalaf introduced into the Nipambare genome. Uh, Nipambare here makes beta tyrosine, Kazalaf does not. And it should be clear that um, three of these chromosome substitution lines don't produce beta tyrosine. And if you look at them, they all overlap on a segment of chromosome 12. At this point already, we had a pretty good idea of which gene we were looking for, even though we had several hundred genes on chromosome 12 that we could be interested in. But also at this point, I happened to talk to Susan McCooch here in the plant breeding department, and she mentioned that they had these really great mapping lines based on a different cross between um, now Nipambare and IR64, um, de developed by Erie in the, the Philippines. And here now in these 300 recombin inbred lines, we were able to, again, map beta tyrosine biosynthesis. And here on, if we look at this as the presence or absence phenotype for beta tyrosine, we get a highly significant uh, QTL for beta tyrosine biosynthesis on chromosome 12. If we look at this as a quantitative model, saying only among the lines that have beta tyrosine, is there a natural variation in the abundance in this population? And the answer is essentially no. There isn't much happening there. And then a combined model looks pretty much similar to the, the binary model. It's sort of hidden behind there. So we have a highly significant um, QTL on chromosome 12. Um, this is um, work I should thank Jen Spindle and Susan McCooch's lab primarily for doing this mapping analysis for us. And we also knew what kind of enzyme we were probably looking for. So in organisms that make beta tyrosine, benafenylalanine, these enzymes, phenylalanine ammonia lyase and phenylalanine ammonia mutase, making either cinnamic acid or beta phenylalanine, are very similar. At the crystal structure level, it hasn't yet been determined whether an enzyme is a PAL or a PAM, similarly, whether an enzyme is a TAM or a TEL. But however, based on the sequence signature, we can say whether an enzyme is in this general class. So we were looking for a PAL-like enzyme in the rice genome, in the annotated Nipombari genome, there's actually nine genes that are um, annotated as likely phenylalanine ammonia lyase genes. And here, one of them is on chromosome 12. And based on the mapping that we'd done with the uh, recombinant inbred lines between Nipombari and IR64, we were able to narrow down to about 25 genes. And sure enough, this gene on, 20 from, on chromosome 12 um, a predicted phenylalanine ammonia lyase is actually in our mapping interval. And so this was immediately our best candidate gene for a beta tyrosine or a tyrosine amino mutase. And that was easy to confirm now. So we cloned this rice gene, expressed it transiently in Nicotiana benthamiana. And then over time, Nicotiana benthamiana, which normally does not produce any beta tyrosine ND is not detected here, starts accumulating beta tyrosine. So we clearly have an enzyme that's able to produce beta tyrosine. Um, this expression here in Nicotiana benthamiana was actually with a histidine tag, which then allowed us to purify the protein and do in vitro assays, the sort of things that make a protein biochemist really happy. And what we see then is that we have you know, increasing tyrosine production, sorry, beta tyrosine production with increasing enzyme concentration. Um, increasing tyrosine concentration. We can calculate the Vmax and the Km. We can find the temperature optimum, the pH optimum, and sort of overall convince ourselves that we have an active functional tyrosine amino mutase acting here in vitro. Um, perhaps more important than this, though, is experiments to say, what does this enzyme not do? And that's illustrated here. The other likely reactions now were either, you know, phenylalanine ammonia lyase amino mutase or tyrosine ammonia lyase. And so in vitro, at least, the only activity of this enzyme now is to convert tyrosine to beta tyrosine. Um, another confirmation that we did is we went to a rice tilling population, and we found three mutations, one of which was a stop coda in our gene of interest, which we're now calling OS-TAM1 for it's the first tyrosine immunomutase. And sure enough, the stop codon in this rice gene causes no beta tyrosine production in that rice line. We can also then ask, what about these other PAL-like genes in, Arabidopsis, sorry, in, in rice? Um, we tested four of these other genes, including this one here, which is about 95% identical to our rice tyrosine immunomutase, 
and none of these had tyrosine immunomutase activity, suggesting that this gene here is the only tyrosine immunomutase in rice, which would then be consistent also with our genetic mapping data. Um, if you line up the chromosomes of rice, these are now the 12 rice chromosomes, Nipambari rice and Kazalath rice, which we'd used for mapping, you see a, a nice alignment of all these um, chromosomes. However, now, if you look specifically at chromosome 12, where we've mapped our tyrosine immunomutase gene, um, we found that there's a region of several hundred thousand base pairs where we get essentially no alignment of Kazalath and Lumina sequencing reads to the Nipombari genome, showing that there's a large deletion here in Kazalath relative to Nipombari, which encompasses our tyrosine immunomutase gene. And so this is also confirmed by PCR reactions. We simply cannot find tyrosine immunomutase in rice lines that don't produce uh, uh, beta tyrosine. This is also further work done by Susan Strickler. This is now the 20 or so rice um, cultivars for which we have both beta tyrosine data and good Illumina sequencing data in GenBank. What Susie did now is look at the uh, gene coverage of our tyrosine amino mutase relative to the total gene coverage. And if this was roughly one, we said that that plant had a tyrosine amino mutase. And those plants also now have beta tyrosine production. So the presence of the gene in these diverse cultivars is highly correlated with the activity or the, or the presence of beta tyrosine. So again, as you see, most of these here are Japonica cultivars. One exception here is um, um, Milyang 23, which Susan actually tells me is an integration of Indica, uh, sorry, Japonica rice into Indica. Probably we, we pulled along the Japonica gene for um, beta tyrosine synthesis, synthesis. And I don't know about this one here, which is an Indica rice, but does actually produce beta tyrosine. It could also be some sort of artifact of, of breeding. What we can also then do is this is another paper that Susan Makucha's lab was involved in, a resequencing of 50 rice genomes, including now what are presumed to be the wild ancestors, Oriza Navara of the Indica rice clade, and Oriza Rufikogan, presumed the ancestor of the Japonica rice clade. And what we see is that the Oriza Navara now has none of these five Oriza Navara have pr presence of a tyrosine immunomutase, whereas in the Rufipogon, one out of the five did have a tyrosine amino mutase. So suggesting that maybe the ancestors of Japonica rice had the tyrosine amino mutase, whereas over here they didn't. These are obviously still quite small numbers, and it may just be sort of random variation that we're looking at here. But clearly, the temperate Japonica ones are the ones that received the tyrosine amino mutase genes at some point during the cultivation of rice. The bigger question now is, you know, what effect does this have on other organisms that might be interacting with rice? Um, this is the first experiment that we did. We had noticed, that at least initially, that tyrosine amino mutase was induced by um, a, a jasmonic acid, which suggested it might be involved in insect defense. And the short answer is probably not the case. So the actual concentration of beta tyrosine in rice leaves was about 100 micromolar. And to see any sort of negative effect on these caterpillars who would be feeding from the rice, we need to go about 100-fold higher in the concentration, which probably means that it's not any sort of insect deterrent compound. At least these two caterpillars, which would normally be feeding on rice, are not deterred by this compound, which could be a rice defensive metabolite. We also did some experiments with the green peach aphid, which um, is very polyphagous, not necessarily feeding on rice. And what we see there is, again, we see some negative effects, but again, only at concentrations that are maybe tenfold higher than what would normally be found in the rice. So again, we think this is probably not something that's relevant in nature. This is not a compound that's going to be inhibiting aphids feeding from um, rice plants. We also did some experiments with Pseudomonas syringi, a common plant pathogen. It infects a variety of different plants, and it was just handy to have in our lab. Um, First off, Pseudomonas syringi does not seem to be able to use beta tyrosine as a nitrogen source. This is now minimal medium with either tyrosine, glutamate, or beta tyrosine as the only nitrogen source, and the Pseudomonas syringi in this medium grows significantly less well. We can also then do experiments saying with glutamate as a nitrogen source, is Pseudomonas syringi growth inhibited by beta tyrosine? And the short answer is yes now. So here at the top is the control. And then already at 110 and 100 micromolar beta tyrosine, 
we get a significant reduction in the growth of Pseudomonas syringae, and that keeps uh, dropping as we go to higher concentrations of beta tyrosine in the medium. This is not simply the effect of having more amino acids in this minimal medium, because if we do this um, same experiment now with tyrosine rather than beta tyrosine, here the control is now the bottom line, and having a little bit more nitrogen in the medium actually causes Pseudomonas syringae to grow slightly better in these experiments. So this suggests that um, two things. One is that you know, Pseudomonas syringae is not able to degrade beta tyrosine, and the other, that beta tyrosine may have some inhibitory effect on Pseudomonas syringae, and by extension, maybe other gram-negative bacteria or other pathogens that might be feeding on this rice plant, though we haven't actually, at this point, tested anything else other than Pseudomonas syringae. The, now, getting back to the allelopathy question in rice, we also did experiments now with beta tyrosine in inhibition of plant growth. The first experiments that we did were with our, our lab rat, Arabidopsis, and we see that as we increase beta tyrosine concentration, we get significant inhibition of root growth of Arabidopsis with an IC50 of about 4 micromolar, so a very low concentration, similar to the concentration that we actually see exuded by rice in hydroponic medium, is able to inhibit Arabidopsis growth. Um, this growth inhibition can be rescued by um, addition of 40 micromolar tyrosine, so the rice is um, adding back tyrosine to the beta tyrosine inhibited rice plants causes them to grow better, an indication that maybe beta tyrosine is somehow interfering with tyrosine metabolism, either in biosynthetic pathways or maybe incorporation into protein or some other inhibitory effect. We don't see a significant rescue with an equal amount of phenylalanine, and also tyrosine or phenylalanine by themselves are not inhibitory, obviously, to the Arabidopsis plants. So this is the Arabidopsis. We also did similar experiments now with um, other seeds that we had handy in the laboratory. And what we found was, what I found at least a rather interesting effect is we tested a variety of dicots and a variety of monocots. And you should see that there's a pretty good break here that the IC20 in this case, the inhibitory, inhibiting roots by about 20% is a much lower concentration for the dicots than the monocots. We had to go with IC20 here because the concentrations here were starting to get unrealistically high when we were looking at um, you know, trying to inhibit these monocots. And in the case of rice, both the nipombaria, which makes beta tyrosine, and kazalath, which does, not, which does not, at any concentration that we've tested, we didn't see any sort of inhibitory effect of beta tyrosine of these, um, on these rice plants. So this suggests that you know, maybe this does have a potential for having allelopathic function of this molecule. And the obvious thing to do now is we have our mutant. We'd like to be testing that. Unfortunately, we have to back cross the um, tilling mutant a little bit. However, the experiment that we'd like to be doing may have been done already. This is a paper that came out in Journal of Chemical Ecology a couple of years ago. They um, made RNA interference rice lines inhibiting phenylalanine ammonia lyase. However, if you look at actually what silencing they did, they probably were also silencing tyrosine aminomutase, and they saw reduced allelopathy in this rice line. So it, you know, we, at some point, it might be nice to go back and, and check these RNA interference lines to see if the effect that they're seeing is actually due to silencing of tyrosine aminomutase rather than other things that might be downstream of phenylalanine ammonia lyase. And in the meantime, once we've back-crossed our tilling mutant, we'll be able to do these experiments in a more controlled manner, similar to the momolactone experiments that I showed you earlier, saying if we knock out this specific enzyme, is there a less allelopathic effects? So um, I early on listed what I think are the properties of a, a good allelopathic compound. And I think we've covered three of these now. We've got a compound that's quite toxic to other plants, at least dicots. It's exuded by the roots and the rice itself is highly resistant. Um, we don't know much yet about you know, how stable it is in the soil, how diffusible it is, does it bind to clay particles, but the fact that Pseudomonas syringae is not able to degrade it is probably a good sign that there's maybe not so much microbial degradation, though you might imagine that things in the rice rhizosphere might be more specialized in degrading you know, nitrogen-containing compounds that are exuded by rice, even if they're non-protein non amino acids. The other thing we can look at is sort of the, the relative effectiveness of the beta tyrosine relative to these other three compounds that I introduced earlier. All of them have IC50 concentrations in the low micromolar range, and beta tyrosine here 
is also in the, the low micromolar range. All of these now are exuded into the uh, medium, at least, at similar concentrations to the, their IC50s for the um, weeds that were inhibited. These concentrations here for inhibition are slightly lower, but the plants are also exuding slightly less here of the, the, the flavone and the cyclohexanone. So what we think is going on here is that we have a combination of different metabolites that can be exuded by rice, and in some combination, these are now um, have the potential to inhibit the root growth or the growth of neighboring plants. On top of that, with a lot of environmental factors ranging from what plant you're trying to inhibit to um, also you know, the, the soil conditions, light conditions. And if we're going to be breeding now for enhanced allelopathic potential in rice, we have now these compounds that we could be breeding for. And in particular here with the beta tyrosine, we have a nice presence absent polymorphism. And this in theory, if it confirms as an allelopathic compound, would be something that would be very easy to breed for. We know where it's present, we know where it's absent, and we know, you know what sort of potential it has. All of that being said though, this might be entirely pointless, at least in, in US rice fields, the number one weed is actually rice. And so there isn't really, since this uh, weedy wild rice is fully cross-fertile with cultivated rice, there isn't much point at all in breeding for allelopathic rice, at least for the US market. So then finally, in summary, I hope that I've convinced you that we found a, a previously unknown and relatively abundant uh, non-protein amino acid in rice. We found an enzyme responsible for its synthesis, and we have some potential function of this metabolite inhibiting the growth of weeds that might be growing next to these rice plants. And then finally, I should conclude now with um, people who actually did the work. Most of what I talked about was done by Jan Yan, who's here in the audience somewhere. Jan, are you back there? Um, Susie Strickler and Lucas Miller's lab did a lot of the bioinformatics. We were very grateful to Susan Bakuch, Jen Spindle, and Chi Wei Tung for providing the mapping population. And then we collaborated with Yutaka Okamoto and Nokimori, and there are two postdocs here in Japan on some of the analysis and identification of these rice metabolites. And with that, thank you for listening, and 